Okay. Uh, this whole paper was triggered by a guest lecturer uh, who's a patent attorney working for one of the left coast computer companies. And he said a bunch of things that really, really disturbed me, so I kept thinking about them. And when that happens, you usually end up with a paper. We, of course, know what patent law is supposed to be like. Is this mystical land where people read patents and they understand what they say? Topic of several other papers at the conference. And then they go about avoiding making, using, or selling a device that infringes that patent. Or if they're a good actor, they go and they license the right to do so. Um, but that reality is just sort of gone at this point. As my guest lecturer talked, I realized there were a couple of issues and a couple of problems that have come up that are interfering with this idealized model that we're supposedly implementing. I'm going to call one of them the haystack model. Uh, this was based on the terminology that my guest lecturer used. Um, I'm going to call another one the OMG problem. Um, and the final one is the troll problem, only because that's necessary to have that in a patent paper. So, the haystack problem. The patent practitioner kept talking about the fact that he had this haystack of patents, and he was really happy with this haystack of patents. And that this haystack of patents made him powerful and made everybody else weak. And when he first talked about it, I was sort of wondering what was going on, so I assumed it was the classic, if he has a big haystack, he has to have lots of needles in it. And the needle that would poke the other person, the opponent, would be found in that haystack somewhere. But it soon became very, very apparent that he didn't care about the needles at all. He really did not care about the content of any of his individual patents. He wanted a large haystack of patents. And what he was going to do with that large haystack of patents is he was going to hit other people with that haystack of patents in litigation. He was going to say something like, you have violated one or more of the 10,000 patents that I have listed in my answer to your complaint, or one or more of the 10,000 patents that I have listed in my complaint. In fact, anticipate your invention so your invention is no good. So he wants to be able to prosecute or defend a suit by presenting this massive haystack of patents so that the other side just has absolutely no choice and they basically have to settle on terms that are very acceptable to this company. After all, if you had to challenge the validity of 10,000 patents, you probably would fail at that. It's just too expensive to do. Well, needless to say, when he started to fully address this, it sort of clashes with the way we teach our students that patents are supposed to operate. Patents, after all, are an individual thing, not this whole big stack of litigation documents. The second problem, that I, as I developed and worked on it, came out would be the oh my god problem, the OMG problem. The number of patents that we issue on an annual basis is a really, really big number. In 2014, there were 300,000 new patents, utility patents, issued in the United States. So if you're trying to read patents to figure out what's going on, you're going to have to read 144 of them per business hour. And let's be realistic. It just takes a lot longer than 25 seconds to read and understand a patent. So the process of trying to absorb new technology has become impossible. As I develop more fully in the paper, it doesn't really help very much also just to go out and hire a whole bunch of people to do it because that introduces its own complexity and its own problematic problems. The other really big number that's running out there, of course, is the three million active patents that are uh, apparently out there. This is uh, right off of the, uh, the blog. With three thousand, three, I'm sorry, three million active patents. Having to parse through three million active patents with uh, basically a 10% growth per year, it's impossible, you can't do it. So, you could say, I only have to read one art class, but if you're anywhere in the top 50 art classes, you're still going to have to read 2,600 patents a year. That's the new ones. And even an hour and a quarter, I don't know about you, it takes me a little longer to understand and figure out what a patent means than an hour and a quarter. It's a longer process than that. So the oh my god problem is simply we can't keep up. There's no way anybody who's being a rational person can keep up with them. And the patent troll problem, there are lots of reasons. You know, if, there's lots of literature out there about why we have trolls and how they work. 
the one of the main things that allow them to operate, and I'm being charitable here, is that they tend to hold large portfolios, haystack portfolios, of very, very weak patents. Probably patents that should never have been granted in the first place, but weak nevertheless. But despite this weakness, and despite the fact that we mostly recognize they're enforcing patents that aren't valid and could be challenged, the economics of challenging them are such that nobody can do it. It's cheaper to sell it, and therefore it becomes a viable business model to bring these kind of litigation. All right, I'm not an economist. I realize this is a session on uh, economics and on licensing, and I'm not an economist. I'm a computer programmer. But from what I've understand and I've learned from my colleagues, this would be what's called a market failure. If you are assuming that people are acting in any kind of rational way, they are no longer picking up patents and reading them to figure out what they can and can't do, because that's simply something that's beyond anybody's capability. So even if you are a good player and you want to do things the right way, you can't. So this is the problem that, that I'm trying to address in, in the patent. I, first off, I will admit I consider this a symptom treatment, not a, not a core problem. Some of my other research on patent quality and on who's doing and running the patent system addresses the fact that we shouldn't have these patents the way we do. But if we're going to have them, we need to think of new ways of coming about and handling them so they get out of our way as a, as a society. So what I am proposing in this paper is what I'm calling a field license. And this would be a form of mandatory licensing of patents, something that we haven't seen before, um, but would handle most of the patents out there that would be handled under a compulsory license scheme called field license rather than <coughs> individual one-on-one -on -one negotiations or rather than our current system of just go ahead and do whatever you want, hope you don't get sued. The way it would work function fundamentally is that a company would be able to buy a field license it would cover a particular field. Now, defining a field is going to be challenging. Uh, we just had a paper uh, in another session that talked just about that. But it, for a it's sort of a, of a placeholder right now, we can think of it as a patent class or possibly a patent class <coughs> with an appropriate subclass as the field. And you'd be able to buy a license for that class, and then you would be able to practice any of the licenses, any of the patents that have been issued under that class. So if I buy a license for uh, you know, a, a, some met, a particular business method, I would be able to then practice all of the patents that have a claim within the business method field. The solution is based on two things. It's based on the compulsory license that copyright uses in a variety of areas. And it's based on the uh, performing rights organizations, the ASCAPs and the BMIs of the world. Copyright has always had a different set of issues than patent, has historically had a different set of issues than patent has. Patents tended to be fairly small in number, while copyrights tended to be very numerous. Lots of times in copyright law, lots of people want to use the same thing, but they do so in very, very small ways. Thus the jukebox analogy that I use as the title of the paper. Shoot boxes don't do a lot of copyright uh, uh, use, but they do enough of it to be significant. So that the concept was to try to take some of the themes from the copyright world that, that work for these kinds of uh, common uses and see if they would apply in the patent world. Okay, now just as a quick example of the different licenses, jute boxes, you do not need to negotiate a license with every music copyright holder in order to put a record in the jukebox, there are compulsory licenses. Cable TV can rebroadcast things without necessarily having to go and license every single owner of every copyright that might be shown on a cable TV show. show. Uh, there's the music cover provision, which again we have paper on uh, at the conference. <coughs> PBS has special licenses. And most importantly, the rights groups, which allow a concert hall or other similar venue to obtain a license for all the music that may be performed in that, in that particular venue. So how would these work and how would they resolve it? We're talking here mostly about low worth patents. There are going to be an exception and I'll talk about it in terms of patents that should not be in the system. 
but the, for a vast majority of patents, they are not going to obtain royalties based on a one-on-one -on -one negotiation. They're going to obtain their economic value because they are within the field license. And if you think about the vast majority of patents, most patents never get any royalties of any kind. They may invent something and may have gotten a, a, a patent issued, but the patent is never uh, rendered to any kind of economic value. Individually, negotiations now with the thousands of patents that are within the haystacks would become a thing of the past because you simply would not need to do it for most patents. Most patents, if you're in a particular field, you can go get your field license and then you don't have to worry about the individual uh, negotiations. Trolls are going to have a harder time operating in this kind of environment because if most of the patents that trolls are now using are the kinds of patents that are going to end up within the field license. There will be no reason anymore for a patent owner to sell to a patent troll simply because they can obtain economic liability from their patent, some liability, just from the field license. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in order to do this, you have to be able to define a field. And this is why it's good to come to these conferences because you can learn a lot about the field definition. The primary thing that we're talking about here is the art unit that we're talking about. And it, just as a practical example, if I'm in the computer space and I develop computer software, I don't care about drugs. I don't need to use drugs. I don't need a license to use drugs. I need a license to use some computer software that may be patented. Now, for some active areas, I may have to be more specific, or the field definition may have to be more specific. Because if it's, again, computer software, that's an immensely broad field. So we may need to have a, I just need a telecommunications field license within the computer software space. So the fields will have to be very carefully defined. The other factor has to be the age of patent. If I'm in the computer industry again, it's a year and a half long life cycle on products, I probably don't care about 10 year old patents. Those are probably not relevant to me anymore. Whereas if I'm in one of the more mechanical arts, or if I'm making coffee that goes in those little the K cup coffee machines, well, those are clearly uh, and potentially going to last the full patent term. The whole system also has to have a degree of flexibility about it because not every art is the same as every other art. Uh, there is a class out there for buggy whips. Well, let's just say there has not been a lot of activity in the buggy whip class for quite a while. And as a consequence, as you're defining a field, you probably would want to uh, be careful about how that's uh, done. The second thing that has to occur for this to work is there has to be a way to accept our patent. And I've sort of identified three ways where this should happen. Okay. One is where the invention is a particular pioneering invention. If you've invented the telephone, we theoretically want you to be able to set up AT&T and make a mint. It's very different to invent the telephone than a minor improvement to the telephone. The second area where it should be possible to carve things out is where the invention is very key to the inventor's whole product line. So if I were running the K-Cup coffee company, initially given the patent for the K-Cup, I wouldn't want anybody else to be able to get into my space because that would adversely affect my entire market. And the final reason I think we just have to have it because it seems to be the case, some inventors are very selfish and they're, they don't want to share. And it may be appropriate to allow an inventor to carve the patent out uh, just because they're selfish. Now the mandatory scheme needs therefore to allow escape. And it could be done either by trying to define what one of these extraordinary patents are, um, which I think is doomed to failure, or alternatively, you just set an election out fee and the inventor pays to pull their particular patent out of the pool. Uh, what happens to that money is a whole different issue. Um, and in setting the cost of doing so, you obviously want it high enough that people who are in this third category are strongly discouraged from being selfish, but you want it low enough that if the invention is pioneering or if the invention has a real import in terms of protecting it, that there's a way to escape it out. So I will take at that point questions and or comments. Mm -hmm. Sir. So I have some questions about the mechanism. So yeah. uh, first of all, how are prices set? Who sets the prices? <laughs> 
again, following the pattern in the Copyright Act, the paper breaks this out, the copyright system has copyright royalty tribunals and judges so set up. So is it the rights holders? I'm sorry? Is it the rights holders? It's run by the Copyright Office. And they have effectively administrative hearings on a fairly regular basis to set the royalty rates for the various different uh, compulsory copyright licenses. I would be proposing a similar system in the patent office, that they have a regular system of reviewing the different art units and determining what the going rate is going to be at this point for each of these field licenses to obtain one. Okay. Um, and then. Uh one further question. Um, so, are you do, have you read much on the patent pooling literature? I'm sorry. Have you read on the patent pooling literature? The patent patent pooling is where a bunch of firms with related technologies license them jointly. So, it sounds right. it's related. It's literature. very it's similar, but this uh, this is much much broader. And if you think about it, it's similar to what's uh, my uh, uh, guest lecturer was talking about haystack patent. Sure. It's uh, the idea of collectivizing all of these rights. So, the economic consensus right now at least, is that patent pooling is bad when the technologies are substitutes and good when they're complementary. So I, uh -huh. I just, I, I would worry that if we're taking a bunch of like competing patents and we're just gonna price them at a common level that we're gonna get an anti-competitive outcome because there's no price competition between the firms and these are, you know, alternatives. Right, it's, it's somewhat different though than the pooling because pooling itself is voluntary. This isn't. You're gonna get this unless you buy your way out of it. So I think the hardest thing to set is going to be the buyout price, not the royalty payment it costs to buy a license. I think we can come up with a variety of, of you know, industry royalty averages, if you will, on a field to, to suit that. I think the hardest part is how much do you have to pay not to be within the field. Sure. I mean, I, I think, do think it's like, I wonder about how effectively a bureaucratic process can set an efficient price. Like usually we think about free markets as being the way that you would want firms yeah. to set prices. And I see the haystack problem you're saying. You're, right. Like I, I see how that would interfere, but that, that would be my concern. That I, I agree with you. If the market is healthy, that the market is far better at setting prices. But there are times, and we've seen this in the copyright world too, there are times where the market is not healthy. And this in the patent world, because frankly, because of the crap patents that are being issued out, excuse the vernacular, because of the quantity of lousy patents that should never have been issued and are being issued, um, there is a real problem in terms of keeping them out of society. Aren't they still making money under your proposal? Yeah, they're actually making money, but at a lower cost to us. So I won't be sued anymore. But I could just make a patent that's worthless and just put it in the pool and just make money? Well, you've got a patent, so of course, theoretically, it's not worthless, right? Well, but say nobody's using it, so it's generating no social value. Uh, but everybody, these days, with haystack patenting and with patent trolling and with all of these trends coming up, people are using those patents. And they're using them in very destructive ways. I don't like this either. I would love to see the patent office and the patent bar be more careful about what gets issued out as a patent because there's so much junk coming out. Sure. Yeah. But the, you know, sometimes just you know sometimes with a fever you give the patient aspirin because at least it makes them feel better. It may not cure the disease but it makes them feel better. This is an aspirin proposal. Nothing else. Yes ma'am. Yeah I just had a quick question for you because you're you're talking about compulsory licensing, yeah. right? And I'm wondering if you've um, thought about how this works in terms of the international obligations. So you have Article 31 of TRIPS, and the U.S. has to comply, and it seems to me that maybe the proposal might be inconsistent with Article totally. 31. So you just would say, go well, ahead and do it. Like, how would you define that, I mean, basically? This, to a very great extent, is a thought experiment not something that's a serious proposal. Do I ever expect Congress to enact anything that resembles this? No. I think the proposal itself would get such a scream of outrage from the entrenched patent powers that it would go nowhere. The point of this kind of scholarship and the point of this kind of article, though, is to remind the patent world that there are problems out there that have to be cured. Um, ultimately, I know there are international obligations. International obligations can get changed too. Right. And if we export patent trolling 
as we've exported some of our other patent concepts, I think the international community even could become interested in that. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so I had one other comment that I can't remember now. So here's, here's my <laughs> probably, that's probably a good thing, by the way. Uh, what's the role of infringement here? With copyright, you know when somebody's playing a song, so you pay and you can divvy it up. Here, there, people will deny that they're even infringing any patents. Uh, you know, so yes, there's this giant pool, uh, this haystack, and there's a cost for it. But but people will say, well, I'm only infringing like one of them. I mean, it's the problem. It's the same problem. It's it's well, that's not everybody we're... agrees that this haystack patenting is a big problem because the answer to the holdup what problem is the defense that says we're only infringing one out of your million patents, which is usually what the defense is. Right, right. The, the point is, though, that with the field license, we're not talking about infringement anymore. Just like with concert halls. But that means everybody has to pay, everybody in the field has to pay everybody who has a patent in that field. Now, if I am wanting to participate in that field, I buy myself a field license. That's a lot of entities. It is potentially a lot of entities, but I only have to buy one field license. I pay my money to the PTO, and then anybody who has a patent within that field can go to the PTO and say, a part of that money is mine. Now, I would hope if this ever became real, and obviously I don't think it ever would, that we don't make a copyright mistake, which is requiring proof that you actually used my individual patent. The BMI ASCAP solution works better, where they just sort of spread the money among all claimants. Uh, that seems to work better. It, so you it's get not so great for the people who are like getting, you know, three quarters of the year time. Right. It's really great for people who get, you know, half a percent of the year time. Right. Well, you can always, you know, you can always pull your patent out of the thing, just as in copyright, you can negotiate a uh, specific license. You can also always pull your patent out of the field. Right. I think that was my BDP. So yep. thank you. Thanks very much.